This is the Winning Strength Podcast brought to you by Winning Strength and Winning Strength Media. For printed copies of mass training manuals, custom equipment, online coaching and analysis, and information on upcoming seminars, go to winningstrength.com. For DVDs, digital downloads, and digital copies of all of Matt's manuals, go to winningstrengthmedia.com. So today we have Mike Kudla, which doesn't need an introduction to me, but is going to need an introduction to a lot of you guys. So what I found was is that when I first moved over here in 2005, you were still playing at Ohio State. Mm-hmm. And all the guys at Westside knew that there were some dudes at Ohio State that were super strong, even comparable to us. Um, unbeknownst to us, you guys weren't getting trained very smart. But, you know, I think I remember A.J. Hawk coming to the gym a couple of times. But I don't remember us being well known to you guys, even though we were right down the street. But to give you some feedback, I'll let Mike kind of explain to you where where are you from, Mike? Are you from around here? No, I'm originally from Cleveland, about thirty minutes south of just the city. Okay. Real small town called Medina. Yep. Very similar kind of how you grow up, kind of out there in the, yep. in the sticks. But uh, went through high school there. Uh, very small Division three school. Not known for sports, and then really started to get really active into weight training as, at a young age. So I started probably in my late, uh, or I probably said my early teens, and yeah. just kind of got after it in the basement with my dad's. He had an mm-hmm. old set of, of weights down there, yeah. and you'd start to add these things. There wasn't the internet at that time, so whatever books I could read at the time, we'd just figure yeah. it out. And then I remember we, you were doing all the weights you can. I ran out of weights. I'd literally yeah. fill up buckets with sand, yeah. and we would just add it to it. And then yeah. you know, that kind of took it from there. Sounds eerily similar to my story. You know, I had my uncle, if you read my book, yeah, I have my uncle come in and move back in with us, and he was kind of a wild guy, and he had sand-filled weights. Yeah. And I remember the first time laying down, and my uncle had had 135 on the bar, and I was like 12. And I remember my uncle, I was asking my uncle, hey, let me try. And he's like, you won't be able to lift that. And I took it out, and I was able to bench it. Mm-hmm. And he freaked him the fuck out because <laughs> I think he was only benching, like, maybe 225. He only weighed, like, 180. But he was, like, in his early 20s. So, you know, when you're a little kid, you see two 45-pound plates on the bar. You're like, holy fuck, you know. It's pretty heavy. Not realizing that that's weak as shit. <laughs> but the point is, is it's, the story is very similar. So you started, you started getting into the weights junior high. Lot like oh, very me. much so, yeah. Yeah, and then so by the time you're in your sophomore, junior, senior year, you're probably getting pretty jacked, I'd imagine. Oh yeah, I started. I started training. Went through nationals four years, and uh, every year just continued to smash numbers. And yeah. it was interesting to watch those plateaus grow, and not only that, just watch your body morph. Yeah. And so as I started to grow more, and I got a lot more stronger. It was neat because you watch it, and I had to transition that to being on playing on the field. So mm-hmm. my strength was important, but also my speed was the most critical. So if I can get to point A to point B and then utilize that, yeah, it was huge. So I yeah. became strong in high yeah, school. Yeah, because what you find is kids are either they're fast in high school, but you don't see too many strong kids in high school, from my recollection, and mm-hmm. just people I've trained. If they're genetically gifted and fast, then they kind of wear that out until it's no longer there, but they don't ever rely on strength training. I think that's changing a little bit, but the problem is, is that the amount of coaches that want to work at that level, they don't. If they know a lot, they're not going to work at that level because they don't get paid enough. Yeah. So you know, a lot of high school kids that get proper coaching are privatized people, like you know, guys that would bring kids to me. Yeah. Or now bring kids to you, or however that works. But so, how strong would you say you were at say sophomore year? I can tell you exactly. So we used to do uh, we used to do these liftathons at every year, uh-huh. and I remember my sophomore year, I was already pressing four oh five. Yeah, so he's pretty close to me. Actually, a little stronger. I remember my sophomore year, I was probably benching about three sixty five, and then my junior year, I was benching a little over, I think four fifteen or twenty, and then my senior year, I was getting close to that five hundred mark. Mm-hmm. But same as you, 
and like to get the, un- the listeners to understand, we'd already been training for five or six years. So, I mean, you know, you're thinking at 18, like, well, that's when a lot of people start mm-hmm. working out, you know, because they're just old enough or 16 or 17, just old enough to actually start understanding what weights are. Yeah. So I think even coming from a small town like we did, we were lucky enough to have your dad or like Tim Smith and my, mm-hmm. Jim Smith and my, or uh, Jim Dawson and my, uh, neck of the woods to be able to kind of push us the right direction, but not push us too hard. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where you also see a lot of kids fuck up that probably could have been us, but they got injured too fast because they didn't know what the fuck to do. Well, I actually had a, a, we had a a gym teacher who was a wrestling coach and he actually went on to Olympics. So he spent a lot of time over in Russia. And so it was interesting as a young age, he kind of took me aside and actually started to teach me how to do pyramid sets. I, mean, yeah. I had no idea what. Yeah. How do you how do you put this stuff in? He was showing yeah. basic forms, but for me it was huge. So think about that. You got a guy on my end of the ball. Tim Smith was a 500 pound bencher at 181 body weight yeah. back in the late 80s, teaching me how to work out. And you had a former Olympian, and that's what's that's what's funny is that a lot of times who makes the kid isn't always the genetics. It's who's around them when they're in those developing years. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we've we've talked about this <clears throat> before because. I mean, I was, you know, the strong. I was one of the strong kids back then because I was you know, fucking six foot tall by the time I hit the sixth grade. Yeah. Um. So I was standing, looking, standing up or laying down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wasn't quite as round as I am now, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, I, uh, I, I mean, I. So I had interest from the high school coaches, and I, in middle school, they had me come up and lift with the, the high school coaches, which helped. But like we talked about it was what probably a lot of our listeners and other people have gone through was everything every set every week yep. was five sets of five there was no variation no. whatsoever and i didn't make any big gains until um high school uh my my head coach's nephew was a uh, was a big dude he played for tiffin and he actually knew how to lift and he mm. came and showed me kind of like you were saying showed me some stuff showed me the proper way to do things and start showing me some variations. And that was the first time I ever made any significant gains. Yeah. Cause otherwise it was yeah. four days a week, mm-hmm. two upper body, two lower body, Yeah, you know, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, five yeah. sets of five on everything. Yeah. So you, so you were benching, what is a junior? So now we're at 17 years old. I was getting close. 55, 500. I was up there. Yeah. Close. And then we're at as a, as a senior, you think? I did over five. Yeah. So we probably both peaked out about the same range. You were a little bit stronger than me right at about 16. And then I can tell you why, though, is that if Kudla would have trained as a power lifter like I did, I started to slowly give out football Mm -hmm. and just focus on training, and you had to maintain football. So that took a lot of your energy and time away. So in my opinion, you having close to a 500-pound bench in high school was way more impressive than mine because I was just a lifter at that point. You know, I played some football, but I didn't. I cared about how much weight I could move versus you cared about how fast you were getting plus speed. Mm-hmm. So when you start adding more variables into your repertoire of athleticism, it makes those specific goals much, much harder, which makes your goal or your uh, progression so much more impressive to me because I know the amount of energy it takes to go do high school football because a lot of those coaches think that endurance is what's going to make you play better. Mm-hmm. You can run a mile, you can play a football game. We all know that's not true, yeah. but yeah. that's the level you deal with. So. When did Ohio State start knocking on the door to want you to come and play there? Roughly, like, my my sophomore year is really when they started kind of, you know, peak Looking interest. Yeah. yeah, John Cooper was the coach at the time. Um, but it was interesting because early on, um, even my sophomore year, my freshman year, I was already starting at running back. I was, you know, strongest guy on the team already. Mm-hmm. But then my sophomore year, I transitioned into a kind of a more focal point. I became, mm-hmm. you know, our starting middle linebacker just like I was, and then putting up ridiculous numbers as far as tackles. But yeah. I started to get a lot of interest from all over the country. And then I remember I got – I mean, obviously, we're, you're from Ohio, so Ohio State was a big thing. But what were some other schools that were super interested in you at the time? Oh, any yeah, – all the Big Tens. I mean, SEC. I, mean, I think when I committed to Ohio State, close to over 50 offers. Was there any school that you considered going to besides Ohio State just for maybe the weather or, like – you know, like for me, here's from here's my example. If I was from Ohio and I'm from Indiana, so we have shit football other than sure. Notre Dame, and they're good every 20 years. But I think the last time Purdue was any good is when we had Drew Brees. Yeah. But I would have, if I was a fucking badass jock athlete, I would have wanted to go to USC, mm-hmm. or I would have wanted to go to fucking Miami. The only reason is because of the weather, you know, and uh, 
not dealing with the Midwest, you know, fucking winters and all that shit. But so you were pretty much dead set on going to Ohio State by the time you were a senior. You'd say. Yeah, I committed my I committed my junior year because I just wanted to get that stuff over with because it does it sucks up a lot of your time. Mm-hmm. And my thing was I just didn't want to deal with all the, you know, the publicity side of it. We didn't have the internet where it was at that time. Yeah, and all I really wanted to focus on was getting ready for the season. So yeah. what you're saying is you got a, you got away with a lot of shit back then that people wouldn't get away <laughs> with now. It 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 was it was a lot easier. I mean, yeah. it was it's a funny story though. Really, I came down for a camp and. Uh, so was, that was what about an hour and a half drive. Yeah, my dad and I we traveled around the country for wow for a, uh, about a year. We just went to a, a ton of different places yeah. and doing so seeing where it's everything's at and understanding yeah. these coaches. But uh, they literally it was a it was a one day camp or two day camp. I came in for one day because I was at another one, and literally all the coaches walked in and they stood at the forty yard line. They said, "Run your forty, go in here, go lift, and that's it." And I remember I busted off a, it was a four 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 nine forty. And you after were weighing that, what two two sixty two seventy at the time? Uh, about two forty five. Two forty five. So you got up to two seventies in the Once later I got into it, yeah. Ohio State. So I was leaner then, but it. I mean, literally, it was like, go run for your. And it was a lot of us that day. I mean, yeah. there was and all the guys. realizes that running that type of speed at that weight coming yeah. out of high school. I mean, we had a dude named. I don't, you probably don't remember him because he'd be a little before your time. But we had a guy at Muncie Central. His name was Eddie Faulkner, and Eddie Faulkner was the backup for Ron Dane. At Wisconsin, so everybody's heard of Ron Dane. But oh yeah, he was a four, four three flat guy in high school and never played a whole lot at Wisconsin because he went behind Ron Dane, and then Ron Dane was the fucking Wisconsin face of everything. Well, so he I would have been... actually done way better if he went to a different school. Sure, but I have seen and I have played against guys that could run those four four ish speeds, and let me tell you, it is fucking a whole other level. That's why. I don't think a lot of people, and you played in the pros too, we'll get to that, but I don't think people realize what they see on TV and how fast that shit really is. So when you get to Ohio State, we're, let's say we're 18, 19, what year is that, 99, 2000? 2002. 2002. When you got first got to Ohio State, who were the players that totally like blew you away with how badass they were? Like, Were there some guys on the team in 02 that, that were – bigger than you thought or faster than you thought or could play football better than you thought all of them I mean it's so different because you come in from a, a different when you're in high school you're kind of like that one guy on the team and, and yeah. you've got a lot there but now go I can do a, a situation where in 02 we win the national championship and every guy that we played with I mean we all played in the NFL yeah. and so I was behind Will Smith he's a great example and you know Will and I started to room together but I mean he watching him doing a day-to-day practice it was he was a freak Badass. I mean, yeah. strong and fast as all can be. Yeah, that's crazy. I remember the only guy that we had at Ball State when I walked on my freshman year and decided I was going to lift because I had to choose between going to the World Championships, which was actually that's that trophy up there when I broke a pretty big world squat record as a teenager. Um, I remember uh, a guy named Aaron, and I cannot remember his last name for the life of me, but that motherfucker was like six three and a half, six four. 300 and had abs and was just strong as fuck and i was just thinking fuck i come from the y and i've been around a lot of strong guys and this dude was just fucking crazy he reminds me of that guy off the fucking program oh yeah oh, latimer uh, latimer. latimer i mean he was ball state's latimer yeah his head through a car window yeah aaron his name was aaron something i can't remember his name but that's when that year you might remember in 99 ball even though we didn't win a whole lot ball state had the biggest offensive line in the country yeah we were all, I think the average was 325, yeah. the line, which was huge. I remember, it was huge. We had a lot of individual really good players, but we didn't have a lot of good coaches to teach them. We were all diamonds in the rough, and I think we had to be polished, and the coaches weren't good enough to polish us. They were good enough that we were raw talent, good, but we were individually good. So it was a completely different scenario than you're. But, so you get, to a, you get to Ohio State, and all these guys are fucking amazing. But you're already walking in probably stronger than most of them. Because mm-hmm. I, you know, I remember seeing a lot of guys come in here. Like, for instance, uh, who was the one guy I trained that was at the uh, Raiders? Uh, oh, Jay. Jay Richardson. I remember him coming in. The only thing I was impressed with is he could bench a decent amount, like 455. But this is pretty good for a 6'6 guy that was pretty long and lanky. I was pretty impressed with that. But I was not impressed with his leg strength. I was like, how in the fuck is he this fast and able to not get hurt? And can't, you know, can't squat 500 pounds. You're just thinking, like, holy shit, you know. That's when I started realizing maybe some of the training over there was just not what I thought it would be, you know. I figured you'd be more um, 
based on leg strength and power. And what I saw is a lot of guys from those eras came out with decent ventures, mm -hmm. but they weren't really good overall lifters per se. Not that that really has got a huge bearing on things, but you know, as a lifter, you come by and go, "Well, fuck, this guy's got ten times better genetics than I do. He should be way stronger." Long story short, so you get to uh, Ohio State, you start working out pretty hard. What? How long did it take you to get to All American? It going through the whole process, going into my junior year, became a starter, and then my senior year was just a full yeah. on breakout. So you're saying when you go to a school at that level, it you have to be insane to be a starter as a freshman or just sophomore. So you're and you're behind some guys that are all NFL caliber. Mm -hmm. So by the time you're a, a, a junior, now you're All American. And what I like about Kudla is you were also very highly ranked in the business college, right? So like. You weren't taking fluff classes. Mm -mm. You were taking like some of the hardest shit they had to offer. Because I don't know what Ohio State's business college is ranked, but I know it's not low. It's yeah. high. Yeah. So, I always looked at it like this. You're a play away from that all going away yeah. at any time. So when it does, what are you going to do after that? Yeah. And it happened when I retired. And that, to me, makes you one of the smartest fucking football players I've ever talked to. Well, and I was Because, <clears throat> I mean, I like Richardson. He's a good dude, but he never had that mindset. And I taught, you know – couple of my other buddies that played in the pros they sold out 100 percent to go in the pros with no backup plan mm -hmm. and it took them now that we're our my age it took them three to four years to get out of that rut to realize that that wasn't going to happen anymore you know and you your dreams came true you played in the nfl but for a short stint mm -hmm. well look at look at the 30 for uh, you you probably watched the 30 for 30 mm -hmm. broke and it talks about that. It talks about yeah. the guys, even the big name guys that went in with. Yeah, but my point is, is that how many guys go into the pros and you graduated with what GPA at the business college? Oh, high threes. High threes. Yeah. I mean, you're talking a bunch well, of yeah. bullshit classes. So now, um, so now you're you're all American and you got amazing grades in the business college, and then um, so, what was the best? So obviously, you in just freshman, you won the national title mm -hmm. with Ohio State. And then you guys, I remember you guys being really good those years, but I don't remember if you won any more national titles then. I, no, we were close. I mean, I, I think as we went through, so 05 was my last year. Yep. And that team by the end of 05 was amazing. I mean, it was just, yeah. it was a freak show. You put, I mean, on yep. both sides of the ball. It yeah. was amazing because there wasn't anything we couldn't do. Yeah, yeah, that's insane. So then so then your, your senior year comes, you got school finishing up, and then did you go to the draft or did you get free agency signed? So I went to the combine, post that, Went into free yeah. agency, and that was the first time I blew my hamstring. I see. So tell the players on basically you get off the season. You guys had a long, lengthy season. You got to train for how long to the combine? Six weeks. You trained six weeks for the combine. What did you bench 225? Uh, 46 times. Okay, and then what did you run on a 40? It was fours. In the fours, yeah. So we're talking four fours. And it was – the hard part about it is you really don't get a lot of time because you go from an off-season workout to camp – to a full season, and then instead of shutting her down and letting your body recover, you got to go full force at yeah. it. So it's hard because your body's yeah. not used to that, and as as muscle bound and explosive as we were, yeah. I mean, once I had a soft tissue injury in my hamstring, yeah, it's tough because you can't have enough time to heal that thing, yeah, and you're and on that, their deadline. Yeah, and that's what people don't understand. I don't think is that there's no time for injuries. You know, it's it's a lot like Predator with fucking Jesse Ventura. You're you on got their time, time to bleed. That's it. There's <laughs> I mean, no. And so that becomes hard because you're you're pushing yourself and you're trying I mean, you're running for the biggest job interview of your yeah. life. And you've got to be in the best shape yeah. and do some freakish numbers. I mean, yeah. not just in that, jumps. So and, you could imagine I mean, playing at that high level. I think that's where smaller schools that have less pressure on them have an advantage going into the pros because they don't have all that pressure pushed on them in college to win every fucking game because they're just looking at individual tapes. Mm -hmm. You know, versus when you're playing at Ohio State, this town and this state expects you to win or get very close to winning every year. So you're basically coming from a somewhat pro season, six weeks, you got to get ready to have the job interview physically that is fucking insane. Mm -hmm. And then you don't have very much longer until you're in spring ball. You are in you go right into mini camp and it's just, yeah. life changes, so you kind of get used to it. Um, the timeline though is just you put so much emphasis on your body. So I remember us talking, you got to, once you finally got signed, you got some training downtime to recover, and then you hit 225 for what? 54. So we went from 46 reps to 54 in, what, another 12, 15 weeks? Not even, eight. Eight. And that's just recovery. So this is what I always talk to people about is, like, maximal strength, whether it's a 225 combat rep test or a 
6'11 competition bench, a lot of that is based on being able to recover. The training time has already been set. You know, you've already been working out this time for 10, 12 years. So now you need to let all that stuff settle mm-hmm. and accumulate and then let you – I mean, that's the most I've ever done is 54. And so as a power lifter, and all I do is bench press, I can – really appreciate the fact of how high you got that number without really being a powerlifting type training. Sure. And still having to run. And minimal technique. So yeah. my background of it really was kind of learning as you go, but it wasn't a lot of critiquing, which I'm sure we'll yeah. talk about, but nothing like we're doing here. Yeah. And it's it's pretty eye open to see the pockets of yeah. power that never yeah, tapped into. Because if you can do fifty six with your fucking knuckles touching your wrists and like, you know, probably pushing the, the bar in the wrong position and using the wrong muscles I can only imagine what would have been doable if, say, for instance, I would have been the strength coach over there the last year right into your transition into the pros yeah. because I think you'd have been well over 60. You know, if you could do 54 or whatever, fucking with the totally wrong shit going on, you could definitely do all that. You know what I mean? So pretty impressive. Um, so uh, what do you have – so we so we go to the pros. You go to the Steelers, right? Mm-hmm. We go to the Steelers, and then um, what? What? Give me, give us the background on that. So got into Pittsburgh. It was pretty neat because at the time James Harrison and I were the two backups mm-hmm. uh, between, behind Joey Porter and, and Clark yeah. Hagen. So it was a. It's weird. It's interesting you saying James Harrison is a backup because the dude's, you know, now he's one of the oldest guys in the NFL. Yeah. He's super jacked. The Steelers just traded him to the fucking Patriots, and they're going to the Super Bowl. Yeah. Like, it was funny because James was super quiet. Yeah. But, you know, it was neat because he worked his ass off. I mean, wow. even then, I mean, he'd been cut probably six or seven times because of the NFL Europe. So they'd keep going back and keep going back. And that guy just kept working. So you look at a work ethic and it's like him and I kind of linked up together in, in the off season type of a thing. And so when they're working out and it's like, it was time to go. He, James was a great kind of one of those. He'd been there for a while. So he kind of knew what was going on. Uh huh. And it's all about effort at that point. Yeah. yeah. And I think what was interesting with James is he kind of ran on genetics for a while. Then he realized he's going to have to train to stay in the game. And then he stayed in the game another 10 years. Because didn't he get cut like in 08, 09 maybe? Yeah, I think 08 he was, he was Defensive Player of the Year. But his early part of his career, it was one of those where do you find your way in because there's only so many roster spots. you got 53 and you got a lot of guys coming out. So sometimes it's not about where you're at. James happened to be at a great time and a good system that just fit. But yeah. it was it was a gnarly team because we had Dick LeBeau as our defensive coordinator. It was Bill Cowers last year, my rookie year. I mean, you, you learn a lot, and that's what I liked about it. It was very similar to OSU. I mean, it was all about effort, and yeah. it was from the top down. Everyone was accountable. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one thing the Steelers has always tried to hold on to is they've been a high-effort team. But this is pretty interesting. So you go to the Steelers, you're in camp, mm-hmm. and you're playing really well. So tell us what happened injury-wise. So how, how did we get to that point? So I had already, at that point, blown my hamstring once. So okay. post the combine. This is in Ohio State? You blew your hamstring one time? or this? Is no, this first? is – so I go to the combine, and you're doing good numbers, but then you're also trying to do kind of one of those small tweaks. How do you get out, you know, an extra couple seconds down or tenths of a second? And so I was training and doing flying 40s and got to – about 38 yards into it, and I just remember I planted on my right leg, and oh. my hamstring just Toasted. grenaded. I mean, it was. Was it a total tear? Like a... Yeah, it was. It was nasty. It was bad. Black. And so here it is, because we have our pro day, literally days from that day, and so, as you know, it's soft tissue, and how do you how do you test on a job where it's mm-hmm. explosiveness? They're going to be doing broad jump and L drill, and yeah, so. You, you're you're kind of limited, but this is it. I mean, you gotta you gotta perform. You gotta perform. So you're going into the pros already having an injury from the combine, and now it's time to show up. So give us some inclination to how all that goes down. So you you do as best as you can at that point. So I yeah. had trained and did as much as I physically possibly could to get my body to a point. The rest of my of my structure was really good, but mm-hmm. a soft tissue and a hamstring that was going to take time. Yeah. Time was not on my side. So really, you kind of go in there and you, you tape that thing up and you put enough sleeves on it to say, all right, you know, it's like you're yeah. taking a bike tire, you're pumping the thing up and put gum on it and say, all right, yeah. when this thing goes, you're going to go, but then you're ripping. 
And so that part was it was that part was hard because you're always knowing in the back of your mind you had that yeah. that nagging injury there. Yeah. And so you just you perform until you blow the tires yeah, off. With no time to recover that thing, which is crazy. So you go out, your hamstring's completely completely screwed up, and then you end up screwing up your elbow, correct? Is this in the same season? No, my elbow was uh was my uh, junior year at Ohio State. Okay. So we we're playing Penn State, the quarterback was gonna get the edge on me. And we do a thing called heel clicking where you dive, and when he picks up his foot, you swipe at it, and he trips himself. Kind of like a horse, you would see it. And when I did that, I was north of 270, and the first thing that hit was my elbow here. Uh-huh. and Right on the crown of it. Just right on it. And then r- during that play, I mean, the whole back of my shoulder just erupted. Wow. I mean, there was nothing there. So all the musculature was blowed out. I had just, zero. There's nothing. And so it's crazy about it. You look so back. So just you hit your shoulder, and it blew, or you hit your elbow. Yeah, yeah. So you impact, think I was, yeah. I was, you know, parallel Superman. to the ground, yeah. Superman in it, and the first thing that hit was my <clears throat> elbow. And then the shock just went it went straight out, almost like a shock absorber, yeah. and it just blew out. Well, the funny thing is, it it was, it felt weird, but it didn't hurt. So that was, I don't yeah. know what it was, second down. I yeah. just went back in the huddle on third down. Yeah. And just played the rest of the year. I never missed a snap, but wow, it was kind of gnarly because you go through that. Yep. You go into the bowl game, and I had a little sling that would keep my shoulder in socket. Yep. But, I mean, they line us up kind of after the season, and, you know, we, we were at OSU, and there was like 12 of us that day, and then this guy's getting a knee, this guy's getting a shoulder. Yeah. You know, we're all kind of in the back thing, but literally seven months to the day, when they went in there and did my first, you know, mm-hmm. repair, I got four screws in the back of there with little block O's on them. That's when I set all my records. So yeah. I did a 610 raw bench, uh, 750 raw squat, and a 430 raw hand clean. Wow. And you had – Roughly about an hour to do it. I mean, those it. are fucking numbers that are just yeah. berserk. Because you think of the age, probably 21 to 23. You were 270, so you're not a fucking humongous dude. You're big. You're super quick, and you're hitting those kind of numbers, which is crazy, you know. And I think you can't really relate to what it takes to bench 600 unless you've done it. And then the other thing is I can't imagine being able to do that and still run a 4 4 40. That's to me is just like we should set that up here sometime. (laughs) Do the Ludus runs? I think that'd be a good idea. You know how he tore his hamstring? Yeah. Yeah. We just need to get like Tom and all these guys out here and just have us getting ready to put us in the fucking stretcher. We'll just we'll just have some uh, hover rounds waiting. Just but yeah, I mean that's just that's just unbelievable. So your shoulder gets grenaded in your Ohio State. You're playing, but it's probably aggravating you a little bit by the time you're in the pros. Then your hamstring gets so fucked up by the first year in the Steelers. Now the pros is pretty much done. Yeah, so I, I was in for, you know, three years, and, you know, my shoulder was in really good shape at that point in time. It was just starting to kind of get sore kind of in the upper bicep tendon there, yeah. but my hamstring was just, just So destroyed. how long how long did you actually stay on the roster? Oh, with Pittsburgh? Yeah, yeah. Until I retired. So when was that? So I filed my papers of retirement in 2009. 2009? So we went through those seasons and – Okay, so you, you stayed in the league about three and a half years yeah. roughly? Yeah. So that that did that in, uh, entitle you for retirement? Yeah, it's different stages now. I mean, the whole program back in the original setup was completely different, but yeah, uh, now it was to a set where I didn't really care about all the other sides of the NFL. My favorite side about it and was just competition. Yeah, it was the internal will to compete. Yeah, I just think it's just sometimes unfortunate when a guy makes it that far. And then they don't really get anything for it. Like, well, it goes back to what you're saying earlier. You got to have something to fall. You know, if the NFL on. wasn't making millions and millions of dollars, then I would. I'm not saying that everybody deserves a hundred thousand a year while they retire, but I'm just saying, like, you know, some of these guys, if they don't make it long enough, you beat your body to pieces for really nothing. Because I mean, still the average is what a season and a half in the pros. Yeah, you make how long three, you make it if you're somewhere lucky. in there. Yeah, and full so, retirement, I think, is still not until what ten years. You have to make like. Something like five or ten years. No, the, the vesting they, seasons they all go at different ages now. So okay. it used yeah. to be there was a the, the system's changing constantly. But yeah. the way I always looked at it was that really it was you're there to compete. Whatever benefits come after that, they yeah. come after that. But yeah. don't really count on it. It's no different than like Social Security. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're just sitting there today, and you're like, well, I don't I'm know not going to be there. I'm not going to depend on it. Yeah. And so it became one of those where you're just like, listen, I just yeah. want to do this because you like to compete. Yeah. You know, like I loved competition. I loved everything about yeah. what it took to get ready. And it wasn't so much the will to win because everybody has that. It was the will to prepare. Yeah. And that was one thing that I always took pride in. What's as, funny is those years that you were playing and at your peak and best was the years that I was in my prime. and I, But in gear, I was doing all yeah. my biggest geared lifts, you know. 
and I was over at West Side. It was mm-hmm. only a couple miles from you. And, uh, yeah, it's an interesting. It's a very similar timeline. Yeah. So fast forward a couple of years, you are you start focusing on business, mm-hmm. right? So where do, you, where do you work at now? So now I'm a principal and a chief operating officer for a company called HPLEX Solutions. So right. we're healthcare real estate developers. Right. We do just about anything under the sun from, you know, walking a whole hospital from full build so we can rebuild a brand new, say, 50 mm-hmm. or $100 million hospital down to your local MOB. And so we do a significant amount. So we've got a couple yeah. hundred million under development nationally. Yeah, that's fucking impressive. Say, just looking around, that's, I mean, that's pretty big, big business now, too. Yeah, it's a big deal. You see hospitals and, and medical buildings sprouting up. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of that's because, you know, if you look at the, and you, I'm sure you can tell me better, but the baby boomers are all older now. That's the, yeah, yeah. the gist of our population is over 50. Yeah. You know, the time of everybody having six and eight kids is over. But that last generation that, did that they're all getting old now yeah so you know i don't know well, and you see you see like uh minute clinics and urgent cares and do you guys work on those as well mm-hmm. like the yeah. you see those popping up all over the place now too yeah which as a parent now i i completely appreciate you know you yeah. don't have to go to the actual doctor yeah or or even down to the, the the you know i don't have to go over to riverside hospital like yeah you know kid has a fever you can take him to the yeah urgent care or something like that sure right <clears throat> so so how did you end up finding out about me around here so it's funny because uh, we had a bunch of mutual friends, and uh, you and I met when we were doing some soft tissue releases and crossing paths. I remember, I I knew of you guys, I knew of you, and you know, following the, it's a small community, you know, and, and yeah. when you know that you were smashing world records at the time, it was pretty widely known. Yeah. And but oddly enough, I was working on a, a project um, with a with a, a banker, and he actually had the chance to work out with you. Oh, okay. And he kind of asked me, he's like, you know, how are you doing? Like, what's going on? I, I mean, are you still back into it and working out? And I'm like, I can't. I mean, I had three shoulder surgeries within yeah. seven months. Yeah. And I did bicep tendinesis. That was my main thing. So post-retirement, my bicep tendon, you know, was just shredded yeah. towards the top. Just toast. Same el- or same shoulder that I did my original surgery. And so they went in, they did a bicep tendinesis and threaded it through my upper humerus. Mm-hmm. And so I got another... Four more screws, another uh, rod, and another uh, washer that holds this thing together. What is it yeah. like going, getting on an uh, airplane, going through security? It's not that bad. <laughs> it's not. They, they don't do like they don't go yeah. into that depth anymore. But I just remember it was. I mean, I going from where I was at and learning about everything like your body, like this yeah. is what I mean. It's your forte. Yeah. It became frustrating because everything that we were trying to do, you know, in PT or treatment or whatever it wasn't working. Yeah. And so it was a constant, you know, back and yeah, forth. Yeah, I think that was my biggest like setback personally when I was starting to train you was like how do you take a guy that used to be your strength and now he's not because he's had so many injuries but he wants to internally be that strong again. The timeline has to be long. Cuz I remember the first time we even tried to bench 225 the first round when you were here and it was about 6 fucking months before I let you touch 225 mm-hmm. because it was tricep, rear delt. It was getting all those muscles ready to bench. And that's where I think people screw up that used to be strong mm-hmm. or at that crazy level, which, you know, there's not a lot of people, but there's quite a few. And then they want to come back to it, and then they start way too fucking fast, and they end up getting way more hurt than they were before. What's more difficult, treating someone who's naturally strong or naturally weak? <sighs> I think that they have advantages and disadvantages. Naturally strong is fun because you can watch somebody grow like a fucking chia pet. Mm-hmm. But naturally weak, people have probably always felt weak, so they're used to not seeing progression as fast, mm-hmm. so they're more patient. So you find that people that are naturally weak tend to be more patient and more tolerant of a longer process, and people that are naturally strong are used to seeing change quick. Mm-hmm. So when NF- NFL guys, you know, guys that could be possibly play in the NFL – they're used to practicing something and getting fat, getting better at it ten times faster than the average person. Does one, one of those groups tend to have more, you know, problem? Is it easier or worse fixing form? Does one tend to have more form issues, and is it harder or easier to fix? Those? Well, I think with Kudla, the big issue was is that he had been disattached from being strong for long enough to realize that it was going to be my way of having to do it, and I was going to make him do it slow enough. But he also had enough you know, trust in me that I was going to do it the right way. So there, there's that mixture of stuff, you know, that 
Kudla, I think, had an advantage because he'd already know, known about me. So that helped that he realized that I already had the knowledge. Mm -hmm. But two, he had enough, you know, thought pattern to go, okay, I'm going to let him take the wheel. I'm not going to try to do anything beyond what he tells me to do, which that makes it the easiest way. But a lot of pro guys that either are or used to be that strong, they get overzealous that they want to be back to where they were before. Yeah. Fat, too fast. And then all of a sudden you're in a whole other slew of problems. So the thing of it is I want to get back, him back up to a four or maybe even a 500-pound, maybe even plus bench, but we got to do it really fucking slow because he's got a lot of damage. we got a lot of muscles that don't work right. Mm -hmm. And it's just now we're getting up to those points where I'm letting you do sixes and eight RM maxes and – you're staying in pretty damn good position. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, let's talk about that. Like, this been, how's, it, how's it feel from your perspective? I think it's a lot different because, and this is kind of like the unknown, so kind of the internalized side of it. So when I was working on that, and, and that guy said, you got to go see Matt. And I'm like, well, I know Matt, but I'm, like, I'm thinking to myself, I just grenaded my shoulder. I could barely even move it. And I'm thinking to myself. Have doctors telling you. I mean, I saw every surgeon jump, across. Yeah. The, I mean, every therapist. I mean, this is, I mean, this was years of deep diving. And I'm thinking to myself. You know, the guys that just go see Matt, and in the back of my brain, I'm going, well, well Matt has multiple world records, you know? Mm -hmm. And he goes, it changed my life, just go there. And I remember that's when we hooked up. Yep. And I'll be honest with you, I mean, 20 years of training, I mean, it was one of those things where I did it, I mean, it was just every day, it was one of those things, and then just stop. And you yeah. physically couldn't even do it because I couldn't even move my arm. I couldn't pick up a box if we mm -hmm. had to do it. And so he I came in here, here. You got here, you were pretty fucked up. And he was just, but he was just healed enough that the process could start. Mm -hmm. But he was just humble enough now because he'd been injured so long that he was ready to do it slow. It was the perfect storm. Yeah. You know? So now I would say your bench is probably well over 300 now if we wanted to test it. Easily. But we don't test one RMs with him, not right. for a while. We're making sure that the muscles are built up correctly. Well, we don't do a lot of one like RM no. tests here, period. No, but it's hard. Like I said, for me, it's hard to calculate how strong he is yeah. right now, but I would guesstimate over three wheels would be pretty pretty easy, mm -hmm. totally doable. But the point is is that you've been back at it pretty hard now with me for, for I'd say, a year. Mm -hmm. And it we're getting you just back now up to 300 in a year. But now the finesse in your technique mm -hmm. is back or should be where it was when you first learned. And so it, it was kind of nice that he had that long break to kind of reset everything and let the process rebuild because I don't know if he'd have been ready to do the work it was going to take to – get everything right if he'd have came to me right after the pros. Mm -hmm. I think it would have been more of a struggle for him mentally mm -hmm. to go, I want to be back at 600, I want to be back at 50 reps at 225. And a lot of times you just can't. I, I think that's what makes the advantage to me mentally is I am totally all about beefing up to get to a 611, 620, 630 bench. Well, it's but fun I, watching someone do that. But I also know that when I get done peaking that, it's time to come back down. Mm -hmm. I have that mentality, and I can do that. But for a lot of people, they can't handle it. Just keep going. They can't handle when they take 550, when they can bench 600, and 550 looks hard or feels hard. Sure. Because now it's like, oh, all I'm doing is fucking wrong, blah, blah, blah. It creates a negative energy. Well, you've talked about it before, and you talk, and, and anybody that's had an opportunity to train with Matt, you talk about it in the gym that one day is going to feel different to it than another. Mm -hmm. Just because you, let's say you benched 350 for eight, last week or a month ago or six months ago doesn't mean you're going to be able to still do it today. No. Because it's going to be where no. you are in your training cycle, where yeah. you are diet-wise. Everybody so has different that. cyclic waves, and even in <clears throat> life, and training is way more that pr perspective. But, but a lot of people have a problem with that. Yeah. They think if I – I mean, I and I still, even after having trained with you for a while, I still have that mentality that, you know, I used to be able to bench X amount, and I can't now. Mm. And there's a part of my me in my mind that says I should still be able to do that. Well, and then the, I don't, maybe, Mike, you had the same thing. I think I that it, it became so different because <laughs> really once I came here and, and Matt, you know, we sat down and kind of got an in-depth, serious conversation. And because this was kind of like a frustration point for me. So for me, it wasn't so much about the weights. So whatever Matt tells me, I 100% I just believe it. I go right. into it. And so it's like, I mean, I did research for three years finding where do you go after you're a high mileage vehicle and you've got parts that are just not working right. Yep. I mean, there isn't a system out there. So yep. more so than anything and, and what Matt and everyone else down here, I mean, it's a family, but psychologically from not being able to do that and then be limited, what they've done to help rebuild all that stuff is tenfold yeah. because you like that competition. You like being able to go after the weights. I don't mind what the numbers are. 
I just like the fact that I could compete. And from day one, I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's easy to say whatever Matt has brought me through. I never know my workout. You mean you watch it, you critique it, you dial it in. But I've had zero pain. Yeah, zero. And that's the trick is building something back up. You always want to go positive. And when you're training, I think especially coming from powerlifting background and intensity and like world record background, I find that all the guys that do at this level, they don't train to feel better. And I'm not saying I feel better when I'm getting ready for a meet, but I know what pieces to take away and give to others and what to keep away. And that you only learn from experience. That's why I'm very, I get frustrated that I think in the training and strength conditioning, we rely so much on the, the you know, the pieces of paper like the the undergraduate the master's degrees and all these things and the and the accreditations the CSCSs and all those things great to have i'm not against those but the fact of it is is trench it's trench knowledge combined with book knowledge mm -hmm. that makes you superior you know if you only have one or the other you know that is a hard hard relationship because if you're just a meathead you're going to be limited to where you can find information and your thought pattern on how to change to things like that. Because if I didn't have a biomechanics background, your shoulder doesn't make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. But I know where all those muscles attach. I know how they react to shit. So I know how to develop them much, much easier and safer. Well, look how many, I mean, there are plenty of strong guys. You can go out and find a lot of strong guys on Instagram that mm -hmm. are injured or constantly injured. Oh, fuck. Yeah, it's I mean, everywhere. Look at my sport. I mean, the average yeah. dude that's up at the world class level is round probably less than fucking football. And it's yeah. because, question. and because to get to that level, you got to know how to turn that fucking throttle up 100 miles an hour and do shit your body doesn't want to do. But why it's so short is because they don't know how to turn the throttle back the fuck off mm -hmm. and let everything heal, you know, and have a long term process to it. Should and we I mention think, real quick that this podcast is brought to us by Perrier. Brought to us by Perrier Water. We need to sponsor <laughs> Perrier Water. Yeah. Just, just saying, so if you, you want to sponsor. Bring it. I'm thinking probably somewhere around ten grand a month would, would be a good sponsorship amount. No, but I think what's real critical for for the listener to understand really is that this is not just powerlifting here. Yeah. I mean, what Matt was able to do for me was to tear me down in a good way and reestablish a foundation that was just was not there anymore. Yeah. And then slowly from that, it's just building back up. And that to me was kind of the best part yeah. about it was all of this yeah. training that we've done is the most unconventional yeah. thing but it's also the greatest thing I've ever been yep. a part of. Well, that's the thing is you look at the the, the 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 bullet points of when Kula comes here, in my mind is, one, health, two, stability, and being able to have a quality of life, three, strength. Yeah. I'm not looking at him going, man, I need another dude like me that can bench over 50 reps at 225. I don't fucking care. What I care is is that he can bench what he wants to bench, but he can do it completely safe, and he doesn't have the aging process that most of the guys that have all this damage would normally have. And that's the real trick is, is that when the doctors tell him to do nothing, they're already setting in the aging process, and they're wanting his body to just get worse and worse. Because once you let that scar tissue settle, and once mm -hmm. all those energies or those injuries start to scar and scar and scar over, you're dealing with shit you can't break loose anymore. So it was very important that we got him in his 30s so that his 40s, 50s, and 60s, and 70s, he's not going to pay nearly as much damage yeah. and be able to have a fucking quality of life. That's the trick. I mean, if I get his bench back up to 500, that's just a bonus. Yeah. yeah. Well, if you think about it, too, it's not only that, but it's also my hammy. Yeah. So, I mean, when I'm looking at this as holistically, I mean, I knew I was my Carfax was pretty big when I came in here, yeah. and Matt's just like, holy shit, what's wrong with this guy? But, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's been so fun to watch that stuff. And then not only that, I mean, I'm working out with you guys, with Rob and uh -huh. Rodney and everybody, Teddy yeah. and Brooke. And so when you're going, you see that stuff. Yeah. I think it was smart, though, too, on your side. You flipped my days. So when yep. you were doing upper body, I was doing lower body. Yep. And then vice versa, because I'd want to keep pace with that. Because uh -huh. remember the first time you're like, dude, your CNS is firing like it wants to go put up your yep. old numbers. And yeah, you got to throttle it. He has 1,000 horsepower spark plugs, but he's got a fucking... 1974 Chevette engine right now <laughs> that we got to slowly put the bore kits in and the cams. I have a supercharger. We're going to fucking blow a rod. <laughs> and that's what, exactly what I saw. And that's the big change that you notice and see differences from with pro athletes is they have this CNS that lights in. But he's one of the few clients that actually comes in. I will let train while I'm working out, even though it's different muscle groups, because his intensity level. Like, yeah. you could tell he used to be a pro athlete. Mm -hmm. Like, even if somebody's doing something that's half of his strength, or I'm going up and trying something hard, 
he's pushing, he's building the environment and helping the environment grow. It actually is fun for Kula to be here because you can, you can feel that NFL and all American presence, like that mentality is starting to come out. Like yeah. he'll, you know, even if I'm like just trying to block out what I have to do and he's over there like, you got this, man. You can fucking smoke this shit. And I'm just like, I just need to calm down. You know what I mean? Like, you're ramping me up. Like, you know, so, but yeah. I like to get hyped. Yeah. And, and, and oddly hyped. enough, it's what, what I miss the most about sports is here. It's hanging out with the brotherhood and the uh -huh. team that's here. Yeah. And so even though like I can't, you know, compete where they're at yet, it doesn't yeah. really affect me that much. Yeah. But the fact that I'm allowed to do those things yeah. means the world to me because I love being here. Yeah. And I love to be a part of watching yeah. everyone else yeah. do so some that's amazing the thing is things. He's, you know, he's starting to get to the point now where he's part of the team. And, like, you can, you know, it's fun for me to be able to give him back that level of what you like in life. You know, whether that level of competition ever comes back at all, now you have that, like, that, that atmosphere again. Mm -hmm. You have that camaraderie again that you like so much about playing for Ohio State and we do, the Steelers. We do have a pretty good that. atmosphere here because it's like it's one of those places where you can lift big and see people lift big, but you don't necessarily feel – you don't, you don't like, feel, I don't like, feel like, like shit if I don't, you know, yeah. absolutely shit if I don't put up the same numbers. No. Although every once in a while, Matt will sneak in one of those, oh, that's, <laughs> oh, that's a pretty good lift. That's what I, that's what I warm up with. You have to break it off. Yeah. Say, yeah. Good I job say, benching with a curl. Yeah, yeah. I'll be like, that is a really good bench for a freshman in high school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's my, or, or you'll I, do something, and I'm sure you've run into this too. So, again, if you lift here long enough, somebody will do something. You'll just hear Matt over the corner <laughs> just yeah. laughing to himself. Chuckling. And he's chuckling. And he's either getting ready to say something. I got something. that factory. I got that factory factory chuckle from my grandfather that worked for general motors and was just you know that yeah. old machinist shop boy it's like yeah. it means you it know means, it, means, yeah. it means matt is either getting ready to say something or he just made fun of you to rob yeah. but i think but, yeah. yeah what's so funny about it it's it's completely different matt's knowledge of biomechanics and everything when it comes to just the human body and how your muscle systems work and how you grow I yeah. think that's a big misperception. This is not just a powerlifting place. I mean, you yeah. know how to take things in microseconds and make it better. Mm -hmm. And it's from all over the place. I mean, yeah. so it doesn't matter. I mean, we, you'd be out there. I mean, that, the most amazing thing, we were here when you did your 840 for two. Yeah. It was the most amazing thing I've seen live in a gym. It was gnarly. Yeah. But then watching other guys walk into it, I mean, they're not coming close. That's, I mean, that's world yeah. record. I mean, that's why you're a world record holder. But mm -hmm. you watch other people here that are not even close to that. They train with that same exact intensity, same but they may have 25s. Yeah, same energy. Same energy, same focus, you know, and that's, that's a big thing. We take a step back. I want to ask a little bit about, like, for instance, in your time either in college or NFL, talking about training, what, was, what were some of the different, you know, because we've kind of talked with other people here in the gym before. Did you see people, were there people that just had completely different approaches to training? Like, did you have guys on the team who just didn't do it or didn't care? Absolutely. I mean, somehow it, still got by? Like, what, what was that like? I mean, Ohio State's a little different because you're in a much more controlled environment. So our our system was very rhythmic. And, it, and for us, it really never changed over the course of four years. We added variation. Dick Hartzell started to come back into it, doing his rubber bands and jump stretch. And so we started to get more into that. But we never we never got into, you know, deload or hypertrophy. Or we never got into banding. And yeah. so it was, it was a little bit different on that. And then when you get to the next level in the NFL, it's, it's a very similar kind of a regimented program, but it's per your city. So – Everything more or less was on you on the outside because we'd always train post practice, yeah. and one of the biggest things that you know I I found it was eye opening was that we know where we're strong at and Matt knows where I'm strong at. We don't train those things. Yeah. He goes right at my weaknesses. Uh -huh. But I'll tell you what, I mean that to me was the biggest change was that you know where you're you're yeah. strong at, but when you're deficient, yeah. he'll pinpoint you in probably 30 seconds, mm -hmm. and then it's fix or rack yep. the weight. This is what we have to change. Yeah, to. and I think that's the biggest thing that's missing in. I mean, we do it with, with tape in football all the time. Where is this defense lining up, and how do we offensively mm -hmm. create a problem? Same thing defensively. If you're on the defensive side and you line up the offense, well, there's always a positive and a negative to how they, you know, they, they line up. Mm -hmm. But nobody thinks about lifting weights that way. Like, okay, this muscle is not doing what it's supposed to be doing. We need to make sure it attacks itself so it's not the weak link. So you're always looking for the weakest link on the field, but a lot of people don't use that in training, mm -hmm. and that's where I think they they falter. You well, know? And it's it's fun training something you're strong at. If you're really yeah. good at something. It's fun to do that. And, it's fucking and awesome. See, yeah, but it sucks to train stuff that you're bad at. Yeah, it does. And that's where it's you know I think it's it sucks until 
you start seeing the success of how you're training, and then every time you test something, you're always stronger because of that mentality. But, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think people come into the gym, you know, and you should feel better about yourself to train, but it's the wrong mentality to only train what you're good at. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think people like specificity when they work out, which is the ultimate curse, which is I'm going to back squat this exact way because I know what I did last week and I want to get a little bit better at it, which is exactly the wrong way to do things which is the way a lot of football guys do stuff is, well, I'm, I'm, I'm training hard, sure. I'm working out, but these are, the, these are the things I'm good at, and this is what I can see progression with with work, so I'm going to do that. But then what it starts doing is hiding the weak links, and those are really the way to, you know, and I always say the, the most efficient way of training is to find the weakest links and fix those because it takes the least amount of energy. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, your energy level, you can only have so much energy in a day. If you focus that energy on your weakest links, your body's ability to get stronger is increased tremendously. Mm -hmm. But if you're wasting energy on shit you're already good at, and you're still ignoring the stuff that you don't have, you know, in your programs, that's where I think it becomes a big issue. And that's how I was able to stay away from injuries so much, you know. Instead of, like, you know, in November, I get a back pull that doesn't let me do what I want. That fucking shit would have damaged some dude and put him in a wheelchair, mm -hmm. but I get a little tweak. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, it decreases the severity of injuries if you don't have those weak links, and that's where. And what I also think is really neat, though, is the way we film top sets or your working sets up to it because, really, it's the, you just hit the nail on the head. When I'm watching film and I break it down, I'm looking for all those different indicators. Where's the guy lining up? But this, I can see where are my knees, where are my wrists, and to be able to break that down and then watch you guys do it here online. Yep. So when all the clients online come in, you watch little tweaks that Matt can see and instantly diagnose and say, hey, by the way, you got to sit back and more on your heels. You got to get your quads out a little wider, mm -hmm. push your knees open. You yep. find un untapped power sources that I've yep. never seen before. Yeah, a lot of that's minor. visual feedback, and then I've felt it yeah. for years. So I know when that muscle wants to do something or an another, and I can switch it, switch it and change it real fast. And that takes a lot of years. And I've only seen a handful of guys that could do it. You know, and the handful of guys that could do it were well-read mm -hmm. and well-trained. And they did it for years. So a lot of those things that I see in that biomechanical mindset of how to break that shit down come from me being in a wheelchair for a whole year. And then when I decided I wanted to be strong, all the ailments that came along with that that didn't allow it to be a smooth road. Mm -hmm. So I find being a genetic freak and having a smooth road to getting better can be almost a, a problem because you don't realize how to relate with people that run into issues. Mm -hmm. When your shoulder hurts, my shoulder's fucking hurt before, so I can go through that and go, what did I do to fix that? Okay, these are the muscles that are fucked up. This is what we need to activate. Well, if you've never had those injuries, that shit ain't in books. Mm -hmm. Like, you just don't know how it feels. So when somebody asks, tells me about knee pain or hip pain, dude, I've been there. You know, I was fucking hit by a car at 50 miles an hour. So... That is what gives me the high advantage is that I had to outsmart myself to get strong. I couldn't just only put in the work. And that's where I think a lot of pro athletes have a big problem is they put in the work and they got better. But they can't – they don't have the question of why all the time. Or they didn't – when they ran into like a roadblock, they just changed the direction or went backwards. I figured a way around the roadblock and then kept going forward. Mm -hmm. Well, I always and, find it interesting. Like We'll get people in here all the time, like at the seminars and, the, and things like that, that are really strong. They're strong. I mean, they're, they're, and we get people that come and train with us that are strong. <clears throat> and you'll point out their, you know, their, their benching too wide. You'll point out that the wrists are breaking, you'll, you know, stuff like that. And they, and think about how long they've been training mm -hmm. wrong. Yep. And they would never know that because they are getting strong. They're not strong, nearly as strong as they could be. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to be nearly as healthy as they could be if they don't get that fixed. But how many people out there that are actually doing yep. pretty well? don't realize they're doing yeah i mean wrong. imagine that's what i mean is imagine one if guys come to seminars and they've only been lifting for three or four months we don't have a lot to to fix that's been right. fucked up for too long mm -hmm. it's the same thing I mean, imagine if kula when you were in height i mean it would have been impossible because we were about the same age but imagine if i was at where i'm at now and your dad would go hey you know we want to work out hard but we don't really know what we're doing what if kula would have came to me at 13 when i was 35 and been like Hey, I want you to just look at my boy and make sure he's doing everything right. Yeah. You would have never created any bad techniques. Mm -hmm. And you probably would have benched way many more reps, close to 60 reps at 225 or whatever. The point is, is that I think people think, well, I can't go see Matt because I'm not strong enough yet. 
that's the worst thing to do is get strong with bad form. No. Because it takes forever to fix. I think that a lot of people, that's a kind of a, a misconception on it, is that really that's the best time to go see you. Because uh -huh. really what, it's so funny, you watch these seminars and everyone walks in here, and why do they set PRs? You know, and you're in an environment where you probably want to think people are going to set PRs because they're nervous. Well, you and the team here start to tweak minor things, yep. and you find these new pockets of stuff. Yeah, and, and it's they like, just get 20-pound stronger immediately. Every time. Every we've time seen, we've seen, I would say, I would say, not giving us any slack. You see, at least half of the class, whatever list I'm doing, half of them create a PR, and I and I cut it loose. Like that could push them farther. Sure. But I'm like, it's not going to help you. You need to go back and keep learning this. But I think the last seminar we had 19 people here at the bench seminar, and I want to say 14 of them yeah. broke PRs. It's crazy. And we drastically changed their form, so it wasn't like something. It put them in an uncomfortable for them spot, getting them in the right position, and they still broke fucking PRs. Mm -hmm. That's when you're like, shit, you know what I mean? And it seems like the better I get at it, the more PRs I see. Now, but here's the thing. Most of the people that are coming to the seminars are only been doing it wrong for a few years. I find that the guys that have been doing it wrong for more than five yeah. tend to start having more problems. So the sooner you get here and get that shit fixed, mm -hmm. the faster you're going to make progress and the longer your career is going to be with less wear and tear. And that's yeah. my big selling point is right. I want you to be as strong as you can and not fucking pay for it. That's the person that wins. You know, all these guys that can deadlift 900, which is fucking awesome, and all these guys that can squat close to a grand, that's great. But if I see them in a wheelchair in 15 years, it wasn't worth it. Yeah. It wasn't worth it. It's same thing in the pros. If you can make it to pro football, but you only play for a just a little blip and you're constantly fucked up, wasn't worth it yeah you know i think that's the bigger point of it is that here i found a way in matt to train smarter and that became kind of a bigger thought because i'm healthier now so everyone's like well i don't want to deadlift because my back's gonna hurt well your back's gonna hurt if you don't deadlift yeah. and so really it's, it's not yeah. it's not to say well let's push this side off it's it's a completely different system yeah where you can implement it so if we're here and someone's in australia they can get the same results, but mm -hmm. really it's because how you, and I think the other part of this too is your generosity and, ch and sharing information yeah. on how you do it is unreal. Well, I found that it's not how much information you give, it's people being smart enough to absorb it and then actually practice it. You know, you can take a horse to the water, but you can't make the horse drink the water. Sure. And that's the thing is by slowly seeing people like you that's had all these injuries and then seeing guys that's, you know, stagnated on strength and all this, in my opinion, you know, when I'm 65 or 70 and I really don't want to do this anymore, I don't want to be the guy that said, I should have gave back more. I want to be the guy that has all these podcasts out there and all these talks and all these articles where if somebody really wants to put the time and effort in to learn how to train, it's all there. Because mm -hmm. in my generation, your generation, it wasn't as easy to find because you didn't have the Internet. You know, when I was in cop or high school, the only thing that we ever got was a PLUSA. You know, and in my opinion, was the only fucking thing. It only had maybe one or two training articles in it every month. That when it came out, you're like, oh, fuck, this is a breath of fresh air. Sure. Like, this is something I can really get to because the magazines and all those things were more, you know, just for bullshit, in my opinion. But PLUSA had, you know, a Kazmaier workout or a Mike McDonald workout, Larry Pacifico, mm -hmm. or all these original guys. And even like my. First thing that got me interested when in um, you know conjugate training was Louis stuff, and when I read it, it was more that not that I thought all of it was right, but it more of like opened my mind to going there was way more to fucking training than what I understand, and that's where I think people need to outreach. I want people to watch these and go fuck. There's a lot of things I don't know. That's a good thing, because I, that's the only thing that makes me get better. And I had actually a, like a rant on Instagram this week about some guy going, well, you know, it's the diet's just this easy. And I'm like, actually, it's fucking really hard. It because is. Because it's easy to lose weight. But if you just want to lose body fat, it is a whole other level, and I still seek information on that. But one of the biggest things that I – was the biggest pat on my back that I've had the last five years was one of them was fixing you, and another one was I was teaching with Eddie and Charles over in Amsterdam and Prague, and both of them said if they were to do it again – and start all over, they would train more like me. And I think a lot of it was because I just didn't pay for all this crazy shit that I did. Mm -hmm. You know, I did it real smart and all this stuff, but watching Charles and Eddie say that to complete strangers over in another country was huge. And that's where I realized that, you know, I was trying to at least go the right direction with a lot of people. I think that 
it, it, a lot of people take it for granted. Everyone's got these you know programs. Let's get in there. Let's get someone in there. I have a young son. They want to get to a, a program, so they go through some local gym. Yep. And maybe they do or maybe they don't get results. The thing that I had the hardest part with was that where do you go after that? Yep. Like I would have loved to known that I could have came here, you know, circa 2005, 2006. But I went all over the place saying, where do I go and how do I get Mr. Muncy? Special guest. We got a special guest. The, special guest on the podcast. The biggest Basson hound in the hey, side buddy. of the Mississippi. Mr. Muncy, but what it's like I Falcor from the what, what I thought was it funny is. about this stuff was that I went all over the, the United States trying to find someone. Like, where do I go after you've blown the tires off? And how many people were afraid to say, "Hey, uh, you know, I want to touch this stuff." You went right at it. I Fuck sat yeah, down here with Matt, and Matt's like, and Matt's like, "Listen, yeah, we, I can, I can fix yeah. this." I'm like this, and I look at, and I, this is what gave me the a distinct advantage, and probably. Maybe before it's all said and done, and I quit training people, it's probably gonna get me in tons of legal trouble. <laughs> but I've had ten fractures in my fucking leg, a busted pelvis, torn meniscuses, all from getting hit by a car at fifty miles an hour. The car's still in rehab, though. By the, the way, the car is still <laughs> in rehab. <laughs> Actually, you know what's what? I, you know what the most pissed off thing I got about? And this goes off on a completely different tangent. But I went back home, and I would say five years ago to my neighborhood, and I can show you the exact spot I got fucking nailed. Right. And for the longest time, that was a concrete road. And my blood stains from where my legs got busted and my head got cracked, that those blood stains were still in the concrete. Like there was one out of my leg where I got compound fractures and then one where all the hair got stripped off my skull and it cracked my fucking head open pretty good, right? Scalped. Those blood stains were still in the concrete and they finally blacktopped over it. Should have cut those out. Of and I was just like, fuck, you but know? They I just sealed it in though. Them. It's yeah. there. It's just... Yeah, it's they're there. So you know when the when the five thousand years, you know, like the pyramids, when they take, <laughs> someone really took a fucking bad hit, right? <laughs> they must have played football here with no helmets. We found some DNA. Yeah, we found some DNA. This, yeah. The car's name was Nighthawk, and the kid's name was Dragon. But yeah, it was that was. So I don't put limitations on people from the shit that I went through. So. Not even that. You don't put limitations on what you can do. No. So it's it's crazy because you're like, well, hey, I don't know what the plan's going to be, but you know how to get. So, like, yeah. I think it's funny because there's times when I won't ask you what I'm going to do. I never I do. Yeah. But you kind of tell me this is what you're going to do. So I don't prepare. Yeah. Like in football, I know what play I'm going to run, but you yeah. know what it is. That's I don't know the yet. Best, that, that is the best feeling, I think, for most of the clients is understanding that they walk in and some of them will ask me, like, what are we going to do tomorrow? I'm like, you don't want to fucking know. I'm like, it's better not to know. So I think that's a good spot to cut off. Yeah. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I have I have a personal question. Yeah. So 2006 Fiesta Bowl, Notre Dame, right? Oh yeah. So I'm now a Buckeye. You know, I've I've lived here long enough, and my entire family, or my wife's entire family, graduated from you know OSU and worked for OSU and stuff. But I was raised a Notre Dame fan. So that was a <laughs> painful game for me to watch. However, <laughs> could you? The one part I, I had it okay with, what was it like sacking Brady Quinn three times? Yeah, it's still, a Fiesta Bowl record. Ah, still a Fiesta Bowl record. Did it just feel good? Because even as a Notre Dame fan back then, I wasn't a huge Brady Quinn fan. <laughs> so did it just feel good putting him in, into the I turf? I had to put it in context like this. There's a reason why, like, even though there's enough motivation to go play, we always have like a breakfast where the two teams go. And I just remember when Charlie Weiss got up first and just kind of – just kind of stated out there like, hey, we're a good team. We de we deserve to be kind of at a, a national championship type of a bowl. Don't get me wrong. This is a Fiesta Bowl, and we were high up there. I mean, we were there. Yeah. And I just remember that Coach Truss got back up there, and he always did it every year, like in the most diplomatic, nicest way ever, basically stated, hey, we're going we're gonna to dominate you guys. Yeah. And so yeah. there wasn't any there, quote, there wasn't any you know extra motivation, but yeah. you get in a game like that is the last time I was going to wear scarlet and gray. Yeah, and we just got after it, and so so it, you sacked Brady Quinn three times in the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. Oh, you got it. So you give us some top. Yeah. Okay, what was the hardest player you ever played against? What was the guy that you lined up against? Was like, holy fuck, this dude's a badass. I'll be honest, it's all the guys I went against in practice here at OSU. I mean, really? there was guys like yeah, Nick Mangold and Rob too. Sims. I mean, you're you're talking guys that went down. Even like my freshman year, we had guys like Shane Olivier and Alex Stepanovich. I mean, you're thinking about guys that went on to have. Legend like Nick Mangle yeah. is probably one of the best centers in yeah. NFL history. Yeah. So when everyone's like, "Well, he was the toughest guy," it was like, "Well, every day in practice, you yeah. went against some badass players." Yeah. So you got—I mean, think about it—he got so much mileage at OSU because those players of those years were all fucking Pro oh, Bowl yeah. badasses. 
So, you, I mean, yeah, you, you walking straight into the pros, you were already at the pros at that year. It was. In those that, years. Everyone but says you have one guy that you ever lined up against or you ever took a hit from or, like, you were just like, fuck. Like, one dude. I don't know. I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I know you were talking about somebody you said Palomalu was, did shit on the field that you had just. Yeah, Troy was the best athlete I've ever seen. Troy Palomalu. And the most beautiful hair. He had some luscious hair. Yeah. I'm not going to lie about that. <laughs> yeah. But for some reason, like, I remember at training camp, Troy just liked me for some reason. He was the nicest guy in the world, but yeah. he did things athletically that were just superhuman. Anybody else you can think of that you lined up against that were just like, you know, you played, you played linebacker in, in the pros, right? Any quarterbacks that ever did shit, you were just like, holy fuck, this guy. I mean, you saw it every day. Yeah. I mean, there's genetic freaks on offense. Yeah. I mean, it's just like this, and I'll, I'll give you the mindset of it, and this is why, like, you and I understand each other so well. There wasn't a single snap in my entire career, all the yeah. way like middle school, that I ever lined up and thought I wasn't going to be dominant. I wasn't going to succeed. Yeah. It's like going underneath, you know, an 800 pounds, and you're like, hey, by the way, there's only one outcome, yeah. and it's going to be successful. <laughs> yeah. So really, no matter yeah. what, I mean, there was guys that I mean, there were some awesome guys that we yeah. played against, like uh, Robert Gallery when he was at Indiana or Iowa. I mean, he was unreal. Then he gets in kind of the NFL, and it was kind of it was a shaky yeah. deal, but. I mean, you just went I, against the best of the best. So you just what about learned. what about guys you lifted with at OSU? Were there any guys that you went into the gym with that you were more impressed at what they could do than you thought? Like, I don't know, like somebody that squatted or bench. Because in my field, I remember well when I was a kid at Westside. I remember walking in and seeing George Halbert bench six twenty five at two hundred thirty pounds body weight, Same. and I was like, "Holy fucking shit!" Like that still is burned in my head. It was the first time I saw Tim Smith bench 500 at the Y at 185, and I was just like, "Fuck!" Like I just, you know, shit you can't fathom. And I, then the only other time I remember that as an adult, two times, Vlad Hazelhoff, which now has that 1100 fucking knee wrap squat, which is unreal. I remember watching Chuck Vogelpool hand him his ass three times in the same uh, day in training. Mm -hmm. They had. Two blues and a green. So if you're not familiar with that, it's 550 pounds of band tension. Getting up. And Chuck was doing fucking 800 plate weight. So it was 800 weight Jeez. and 550 in band. Okay? It was something something right around there. Keep in mind, this has been 10 years ago. But I remember the two blues and a green, and I remember it being somewhere around 800 pounds. And I remember Chuck getting underneath it and doing it the first time. And I thought both of his legs were going to fucking break. Mm -hmm. It was just like he picked it up and you could see his body wasn't shaking anymore. It was going into like his fucking eyes were blacking out. Like his body was like, it was like the shit you Shutting hear out. about like a girl ripping a car door off out of a yeah. burning car to get a kid out. Yeah. Like it went to that level. And I remember Vlad thinking he could crawl underneath it and do it because he was on top stronger than Chuck and he got fucking pinned with it. And where was five of us, and five of us couldn't get it off of him. Like, we had to, like, get it off his back and set it on down on the ground because mm -hmm. we couldn't lift it up with him, five of us and him. And then he tries it again and gets crushed. And again, well, then. What, part, what point do you just say, like. You I'm, well, it's like, we're like, dude, fucking stop. We were telling him, and he's like, no, we, I do it. Yeah. <laughs> you don't understand, yeah. right? He had that. But he had it the worst way, that mentality, right? Yeah. And. I remember he goes to the meet two weeks later because that was a circuit max training. Yeah. He goes to the meet two weeks later, and he fucking smokes 1150, which is the world record. I mean, makes it look like a toy. Mm -hmm. And he was the only person I'd ever seen that could go to a gym and get crushed and crushed and crushed, and he would go to a meet and he would succeed. It was like when the pressure was really on outside of training, that fucking guy could step up and perform. And now, you know, then we leave Westside, I think a month or two later, he blows both knees out. Now he's back, and he's squatting 1,100. That is the strongest fucking legs I have ever seen in my life. Yeah. And I'll never see anything that tops it other than when I saw Milanichev when I was down at uh, squat like 1,013 in knee wraps. This is when 1,000 knee wraps was, like, untouchable. Mm -hmm. And I saw him do it like a toy. And that was my favorite thing is I outbenched all those motherfuckers. <laughs> and those guys, I'm like, because I out squatting them. <laughs> and I'm watching them deadlift, and I'm like, and I'm not out pulling them. And I was I outbenched him, and I was like, you know, I remember like uh, Milanichev coming up to me and going, "Dude, that's a fucking beastie bench." And he couldn't talk English, but his coach, yeah, was like he tell me you have beastie bench, <laughs> you know, because I'm like, yeah, you motherfuckers outweigh me by sixty five pounds, and I just outbenched your asses. But 
Do you have anybody like that that when you walked in or saw him do a play or a squat or a bench and you were just it just blew you away like that? Yeah, there was a guy who was before me, but he used to come back, and it was Charles Bentley. Charles Bentley. So he was out. I mean, he he has an O-line performance center now, and, and he yeah. only does offensive linemen. It's, yeah. it's very similar here. It's invite only. Yeah. You get in, you get you go into it. But he came back a handful of times, and we would be training. But Chuck was so dense and so powerful. Like, we were able to go at it. Well, at that point in time, it, it was kind of almost like what here. Like, you're smashing numbers that are just ridiculous. Yeah. And I was able to put stuff on bars that were just ridiculous. But for me, it wasn't really hard work. I mean, uh -huh. you're just used to that. Yeah. So when I got around with Charles, and Charles could move some stuff, I mean, this guy was strong. Mm -hmm. um, that was part of my favorite times. And then yeah. I'll be honest with you, when you came down getting ready for the slats meat prep, I mean, there you did stuff that I never thought physically would be humanly possible. Yeah. I mean, you're doing pin poles with weights that – were yeah. gnarly or your benches yeah. that were just insane yeah. and you're doing your squat sets yeah and it was that just last, that last circuit max style the, 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 unfortunately the meat meat didn't come out the way i wanted but that 475 with that double orange band that bench that's a 675 and that and the, the day before i had squatted that 845 for two oh it was gnarly i decided to use the band for circuit max and i did that fucking 475 with a double orange band which is basically a double purple which is 200 pounds of band tension. So I did 475 with 200 pounds of band. But, um, yeah, I mean, I remember, and probably because you'd be one of the only pro guy, pro football guys I ever get on the podcast, hopefully not, but let's just say that. But Richardson, I remember him telling me that story about Sap. And Sap never worked out, never trained. He could just show up and puke his guts out, out of shape, and then two, three weeks his body would be Pro Bowl status because he was just a freak. But I remember him telling me that as rookies – all the rookies bet Sap that he couldn't bench 405 cold because he never lifted. And so I remember Richardson saying he laid down 1,000, and Trevor Scott said he laid down 1,000. Those are the two Raiders guys I trained. And uh, he said uh, three or four of the other fucking rookies of that year, which this had been 05, you know, 06, um, they all laid down. So there's six dollars $7,000 on the ground. And they all bet Sap that he couldn't bench 405. And Sap walked in fucking cold. Grabbed 405. Keep in mind, Sap is not a weightlifter. This dude never lifts weights. He grabs fucking 405 and comes down and comes up and puts it back. 405. Now, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm a bencher. You're a bencher. 405 ass fucking cold is not easy. I've only seen a handful of dudes be able to do it. And for a non-lifter to come in and do that was fucking crazy. But I remember some of those things being burned in my head. I remember uh, Hawk coming to Westside, and he, he was pretty strong. Mm-hmm. I remember him being able to move some shit around, you know, for not being a lifter. Yeah. I mean, obviously he wasn't us, but to be a runner and a lifter, so I could have only imagined if you would came over, that would have been fucking crazy. But those were the big things that stood out in my mind in powerlifting. I remember Vlad doing those crazy circuit max squats and squatting 1250. I remember Chuck pulling, like, 1,030 pounds off a of pin three out of a fucking deadlift rack. Jeez. At 240 pounds body weight, I remember that. I remember the first time I met Chuck, he was able to deadlift 800 sumo or conventional at 198. Jesus. Wow. And he did it the same fucking day. Because I don't know why they were showing off, but they were doing like sumo maxes. <laughs> yeah. And then I remember Louie going, hey, Chuck, pull out fucking shit conventional. And he mm -hmm. comes in and fucking pulls it conventional. And that was like pound for pound deadlift in my eyes. That was like the crazy shit I had seen at that point. I was only like maybe 20 years old. Um, so there were some weird things that stuck out in lifting. Maybe that's easier to do in football because at football, you know, you have those things. But do you um, have a, a maybe the do you have a favorite single favorite game or favorite memory or like favorite play or anything from a game? OSU. Yeah, any any game when we played the state up north. I mean, it was yeah, Michigan. It was awesome. What's the? Yeah, I guess that would be a really good thing to kind of tap into before we close. Is like, <laughs> what does that feel like? Because I, you know, I grew up in Indiana. So the Michigan Ohio State thing is like foreign to me. I get it now because I've been yeah. here 10, 12 years. Like I make it makes sense. But is there just what is the feel of that? Like how does that From work? A player's viewpoint. I don't understand. Like I don't like you know what I mean. How it's, how do you not entrenched. treat that like a normal game? It's entrenched. Is it just so, the coaches hype it up when you get here? No, it's a it's a state of Ohio thing. Like, is it because you're from Ohio? You grow so, up with it. So did the Ohio State players that were younger that maybe didn't come from Ohio? Did they have that same feel? It gets injected to you from day one. Is it mostly I mean, from it's the... everywhere? Hmm. And so, like being here, I mean, growing up as a kid, 
you just remember it was the game. And there was no – it was so funny because I grew up in Cleveland, so it was like Cleveland versus Pittsburgh. You know, it was like yeah. this this heated rivalry. Well, then I ended up with Pittsburgh, and it's like all these clots of Steelers fans start showing up. But, like, <laughs> yeah. but that game, like we, everything we do during the season, like we'd have a maize and blue period in practices were specifically geared towards that. Mm-hmm. And so, like, as the season went on, when that game got there – it was a completely different week. I mean, we'd have Earl Bruce come in on Sunday nights, and he would rip for about 30 minutes. Yeah, I, you know what? I trained Earl Bruce, and yeah. a lot of people don't know that, but I trained Earl Bruce for two years when he could still drive himself. By the way, me and you need to both go up and see him at yeah. the Alzheimer's unit, but that son of a bitch, you got him on talking, and it wasn't even about Michigan, but he would start talking about something he was passionate about, and it was like I could see why oh, it, they bring him in there to talk oh, to yeah. those players because he starts like – he should have been a goddamn preacher or something because he has like this switch of like, and it's I, perfect. It I just we had a fucking guy in here named Springfield, which he was a, <laughs> he was a total. We could do, do an entire podcast. We need to bring it, but where is he now? Yeah, but he was arguing because he was a Michigan fan. He was oh, arguing Jesus. to Earl in here oh. about how he could throw the football oh, seventy man. yards and pads, and Earl goes, "You stupid motherfucker." You could never throw that ball that far. I've only ever seen two. I'm like, you're talking to Earl Bruce Springfield. Quit fucking lying. Like, you know oh what I mean? God. It's kind of like yeah. talking to me. Like, I can squat a thousand. Yeah. The worst like, part is I wasn't here for that, but I can oh, picture the so, entire exchange. Yeah. So in my Earl mind. was starts to get beat fucking red, and he's like, he's basically telling Springfield he's an idiot. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like, I've only ever seen two athletes, and he named them, and they weren't from this era. They could throw seventy yards. He's like. In full pats, and he's yeah. like, and that one mother, those one of those two motherfuckers <laughs> ain't you. And I was just like, you you're one. a badass. Yeah. He just fucking walked away. But you know what's funny, man? When you were tech, I do have a, an answer to that one about the toughest guy. I'll never forget. I was 18. Yeah. Orlando Pace walks into the indoor field. So in, oh, in the yeah. off season, a lot of guys came back and they would train. So we always come back in the off season train. I remember I was 18, and the guys were like, "Go give Orlando some reps." Now we're just in you know, shorts and a t-shirt and it's, yeah. you know, light duty stuff. Right. No matter what I did, I, I didn't move. Yeah. And he, he was so good. Six, eight. I mean, his head's this big. Yeah. His feet were like a running back. It was the most incredible thing you'd ever see because. So I mean, this is when you were first at o- OSU. As a freshman. O- Orlando Pace. And he's out there just getting some work done. I mean, you're talking about one of the top tackles in NFL history. Yeah. And. Yeah. Just it, was a, almost, it was almost like somebody played a, a like. See, that two. would be. This, It'd be like, like coming in here on Matt, yeah. <laughs> on Max back effort day, you know, and it's. Yeah. It's, keep up, keep keep pace with Matt on that bench. Yeah. For, yeah. Yeah. It, that's it's just crazy. Like, yeah, I can only imagine. That's that's where you have such a different view of going into the pros because probably going into the pros for you wasn't a big fucking deal because you were playing against pro bowlers all through Ohio mm-hmm. State in those years where like. You know, I don't know if as many guys from Ohio State go pro as it did when you played. Yeah, I mean, the maybe they do, but back then you Percentage was played, a little bit different now. I think you played against guys that were more Pro Bowl status in college than they do now. Yeah, it was a say. different different time. I mean, yeah. what's funny about it really is, like, I always look at it like this. I can, I, you know, when I close my eyes at night, there's no question, like, for me, like, that last game against Notre Dame, yeah. mm-hmm. the last play of that game – would shut it down. I got a sack. Yeah. yeah. And that's how I ended my career. And I look at it like I left nothing on that. I mean, there's yeah. nothing left in this thing. You went 100, 100 fucking I miles turned it over. It's amazing game, yeah. And so I, what's funny about it, it's it was like. painful at the time, but it, yeah. Well, if you think about it, it's like you left everything on those platforms. Yeah. It's yeah. like, and you still do it. I mean, you yeah. come in here and there's like nothing left. That's why people ask me about retiring. I still love training, but I competed so much. It's like I don't feel like I don't have that put my head into that fucking wall anymore. I have, I want to bust my fucking body and train hard, but it's just like, there's that, when I went to competitions, I was willing to tear everything off, Mm -hmm. just like you were. And that's the difference I don't have. I'm getting smarter. I'm older now where I'm like, okay, that fucking hurts and it's not a good hurt and I'm ready to cut this thing down. When I used to do meets, I was ready to tear shit off. And you can also focus on other things now too. Yeah, I mean, you know, doing these podcasts, for example. It's like, not something we could have done if you no, were No, two right. years ago, I fuck you, I'm at home resting, dude. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to talk about this You fucking call us on a cell phone. I'd be holding a cell phone up to a microphone right now. So I think that's a big difference, and that's where I think you have a good outlook is you did give it 100 miles an hour. I gave it 100 miles an hour, and that's there's a different set of relaxation you have with that mm-hmm. because it's a part of your life. You realize, okay, you know, other things are important now. I still want to be in shape, 
you still want to, I'm sure, still have desire to watch football. But you, when you play that 100 miles an hour shit and you've done something 100 miles an hour for long enough, you realize when it's time, it's like your body's telling you, okay, here's the trade off. You can stay in longer, but you're going to pay for it now. Sure. And that's when I started feeling. And that's when I started realizing, you know, and I'm sure you had the same thing with football. But you transitioned, though. I mean, what's funny about it is that you give everything every day in here yeah. you leave it all out there there's nothing that's held back yeah and that's why i'm so fucking tired at night it feels like i even if i only work for four or five hours it's like everything i have is gone it's like you know whatever i had that day is gone so that's what you get here at ludus magnus that's what mike gets anything closing you want to say or no i mean it's i think for a lot of people that watch this stuff is that i mean there's there's a lot of different ways to get in touch with this place and i can tell yeah. you on my side of it it changed my life. I mean, yeah. there's, I'm more healthier today than I ever thought I could be. Yeah. And I, I owe a lot to you. I mean, I really yeah. appreciate that. I think you know that, yeah, oh but yeah. whatever, I mean, like when you say something, I just, you, you, you naturally follow cause you've been there. Yeah. But yeah, it's, yeah. That's what's special about this place is we've all tried to be there and we've all keep reading and keep learning and keep experimenting and keep trying new things. And that's what separated me from a lot of the splits that I had while I was here and went different places is that, I grew into my own, my own, and I actually did my best when I had my own shit to do. Because mm -hmm. then I was full circle. I knew what I needed. And you never stopped. No, and I never stopped. So you continue. Even now, it's like you come up with these really neat, like series or exercises or stacks, and it's just like, mm -hmm. holy shit, you know? Like, yeah, yeah. And a lot of it just just comes to me. Like I just it pops in my head, and a lot of it is you guys help me make myself better, and you guys your own. Because you don't even realize when you're doing stuff. Even if I'm on the other side of the gym, I'm watching. Yep. to try to figure out what's the next step, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes the weaker person tells me what to do to get stronger or another person that has a different problem. And it's just, it's weird how that stuff comes full circle when you see people train is you actually learn more. I learn more from watching others now than I do myself because mm -hmm. I've felt like I've dialed myself in so far that the problems are so small. They're so hard to see, but with you guys, you can see these, you know, one and two inch variations that, make all the difference in the world, make stuff fun to train. I think it's like anything else. You get up to a certain point, it gets really, really hard to be fun anymore because it's more work because all the easy stuff to fix is gone. Mm -hmm. Now it's all this little minute stuff. And it's like, all right, you want to get your bench 10 pounds stronger? Two more years. Not two more weeks, not two more months. It's like it's going to take two more fucking years for that tricep to, like, react to something. And that's where I always knew, I think, and I've talked about this before on podcasts, is that I never was the – genetic freak coming out of the gate i had to work a lot of years to get really good but then i always knew that years were all i had anyway mm -hmm. so you're either going to be a badass or you're not but you know you just have to put the work in so um i think that's really neat that we both had the same background started so young and we're almost similar strengths all the way through our teens and 20s it was pretty pretty interesting so mike kula nfl steelers osu all american i mean it's badass you know now is it ludus magnus just staying healthy so awesome all right thank you sir thanks guys yep. thank you once again for joining us here on the winning strength podcast don't forget to check out winningstrength.com and winningstrengthmedia.com for all of your training needs and while you're at it subscribe to us on itunes and stitcher and if you get a chance give us a five-star review we appreciate it We'll see you next time on the Wedding Strength Podcast.